So we are going to talk about what? The opposite of infinity? What is the opposite of infinity? If it's not in minus infinity, then it is something that is the smallest thing ever. What is the smallest thing you could have and not quite zero? The closest thing to zero. It's called an infinitesimal. Is it even a thing? Um, because there should be something about that that makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. It's been an idea that's been controversial for a long time. I mean, thousands of years. Some people like it, some people hate it. So what would an infinitesimal be? Yeah, smallest number possible, uh, close to zero as possible. So it would be something that's bigger than zero, but it's smaller than all other numbers. Let's say R for number, real number. Okay, so it's smaller than everything else. That is slightly uncomfortable because of this. Now, if you had two numbers, if you had a less than b, uh, there is always a number that I can fit in between. Let's call it c. There's always something I can fit in between. And I can prove that because c could be uh, a plus b divided by 2. And that's proven. There's always something you can slip in between two numbers. No matter how close you think they are, you can always slip in something else. So the idea of having the next number to zero makes intuitive sense, um, but mathematically, it's, it's alarm bells ring. So this has always been a problem, um, but people use them to solve problems like this. So let's say I have a circle and I want to know the area. Uh, so this is one way you could do it. Uh, I could take my circle and I could split it up into triangles. These are meant to be very small, thin triangles. These are wedges at the moment, but that's the problem. We're going to pretend they are triangles. Now they are wedges. If I pretend it's a triangle, that means it has a straight base. But the thinner it is, then the closer it would be to a triangle. So you kind of say, OK, well, let's pretend they're really, really slim. Right? Like the base is an infinitesimal, really slim, as slim as possible. And then what you do is you take this circle of triangles and you kind of unwrap it like a hand fan. You know when you take a hand fan, you go like that. So that's what I'll do with this circle. That's my first triangle down here. Right? So that's my centre. I'll take my first triangle. Right, so there it is, down here at the bottom. I take the second triangle, still connected to the centre. I've kind of stretched it though, so it looks like that. And I take the next triangle, it's a bit stretched again, it looks like that. And I take the next triangle. Right, so I take all my triangles, I stretch them out. They're all connected to the centre though, like they were before. Right, so they get really stretched out, really thin. So they turn to this. Right? It's actually turned it into a, a triangle. You can see that? Can you see that triangle I've done? My drawing is bad. You see that's a triangle. Now each of these triangles here, the slim triangles, have the same area as they did to begin with. They've been stretched, the perimeter is different, but they have the same area. Because what is the area of a triangle? It's a half the base times the height. Uh, although they've been stretched, they've got the same height up to here. They've got the same base, and so the area is the same. But the big triangle I've made, it has height altogether, uh, the radius of the circle, r. And the length of its base is the circumference of the circle. So what is the area of this triangle? It is a half. At the base is the circumference. The height is the radius. That is the area of the triangle. Uh, the circumference, 2 pi r, right? So it's a half times uh, 2 pi r for the circumference times r. And you get pi r squared. And that is the area of the circle. You get the right formula so for the area of the circle. And so you did it by splitting it up in thin bits and kind of adding them together with this clever idea. Uh, the guy who came up with that idea is Kepler. Do you know Kepler, the guy who worked out the elliptical orbits of the planets? So he was interested in working out the areas of an ellipse. There is something that should make you feel uncomfortable, though, because there's, there's always that little small error, isn't there? I mean, I was saying these triangles were approximating the wedge. There's always this. And this is what the problem people have had with infinitesimals. It's always should not quite. Yeah, what happened to all those curved bits? So what they did, what the mathematicians were doing um, when they were using it is they were ignoring them. So these mathematicians who were using infinitesimals were saying, well, it's really close to zero, we'll ignore it. And then there were other mathematicians saying, well, hang on, 
You can't just ignore, it might be close, but it's not the same. And they, they can't be ignored. And this is the problem people have. But yet, it seems to have worked. Uh, I'll show you a, a different idea that they used to do. Right, I'll just throw my money around. Because yeah. I'm so rich, I can throw my pennies around. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is I've got my stacks of pennies here, and they're meant to be two cylinders, right? Uh, but if I took this one and started to mess it up a bit, so it wasn't a cylinder, I had to do something like that. Okay, so that's not a cylinder anymore. But the idea is what the, what the mathematician said was, well, if you took it, if you compared them slice by slice, then each slice has the same cross-sectional area, like a, the area of a penny here. So you can say that this uh, has the same volume as a cylinder. It's not a cylinder, but because you can compare it slice by slice, instant by instant, they have the same volume. Uh, but those, those slices don't have depth. They don't have volume themselves. So you are comparing cross-sectional area to cross-sectional area. So it's kind of like adding up all these cross-sectional areas, but they don't have depth. So you're adding up all these zero, uh, these things with zero depth. So how can you add them all up and get a volume? But that's, a, that's something they would do. You can compare two shapes like that. And if, they, if each instant has the same area, we can say they have the same volume. So there was this idea going around as well. And then it was, infinitesimals were really important when uh, Newton and Leibniz started to use them in uh, when they in, well, discovered or invented calculus, which is a massive subject in maths, really important. So in the 17th century, they discovered calculus. Uh, and this was trying to work out the area under a curve. Right, so let's try and work out the area under a curve. So what you could do is you could take this curve, you want to find the area underneath it here. Uh, so you could split this up into thin strips. And you were saying that each of these strips were like a, a rectangle. If you, had, if you turn that into a rectangle, you do get a little bit of error. But the thinner the rectangles, the smaller the error. So you could add up all these rectangles and find, uh, find areas under curves, which is something mathematicians do. And so what Newton and Leibniz were doing, I might use a different colour. So they chopped it up. And let's say you have like a, a little bit more here. Just make it a different colour. So the base of this rectangle is something small, infinitesimal perhaps. Um, I'll call that, oh, I'll call that delta. That's actually a traditional notation. So let's do that. And what they were saying is, if this uh, curve, you call these curves things like f of x. So what I'm saying is, if this here is x, then this is going to be x plus delta, x plus a little bit. And the width of the base is delta. If you work out this area, all, all the way up to uh, x plus delta. Let's take the area of all the way up to x plus delta, and I subtract all this green bit here, that's less than x. So subtract the area that is here below x. That is equal to the area of this strip. So I've subtracted all the other strips. Uh, and what is the area of that strip? It is f of x, that's the height of the rectangle, multiplied by this little base. Or to put it another way, you can say the function is uh, x plus delta minus the area less than x divided by delta. So what they noticed is that the function was rate of change of area. Uh, it might sound a bit uh, abstract, but this is the big discovery that Newton and Leibniz made. That was actually hugely important because it means that you could work out area by working out rate of change. And rate of change was something that they could do. And New Newton and Leibniz were both working on this at the same time. And they both knew of each other's works, kind of, um, but Leibniz pu published first. And then Newton published three years later his Princi Principia Mathematica. And there was this big debate about who, who came up with it first. Uh, and it got really nasty. Newton was really, you know, he really wanted to protect his discovery. Um, and Leibniz was almost, oh, you know, couldn't be bothered to argue anymore. And, uh, and in the end, they set up this committee to work out who discovered calculus first. And it was all Newton's friends. 
and Newton himself wrote the report. And do you know what? They discovered that Newton came up with it first. Uh, and so, and Leibniz then died uh, with his discovery, I guess, taken away from him. Or, you know, the, the, you know, the honour of the discovery taken away from him. And historians have looked at their notes and they've decided that they came up with it completely independent of each other. Uh, so now they both get credit. But this uses infinitesimals. It's the same problem. And Newton knew, that, knew this as well. There's always this little bit of error. It doesn't, doesn't quite work. And in the end, uh, about 200 years later, they started to tidy this up and they got rid of the infinitesimals. They realised you don't need to use the infinitesimals. They, started, uh, they had this new idea called limits, where these could get thinner and thinner and thinner and they would approach zero. And this is called a limit, and this was mathematically rigorous and consistent, and it meant that you didn't have to use infinitesimals to work out these areas, and they could be thrown out of the theory and not needed anymore, and there are no infinitesimals in the real numbers. They were gone, and then they made a comeback. It's you can't keep a good idea down. It made another comeback in the 20th century. It took to the 20th century for it to make another big comeback. The 1960s, uh, a guy worked out a system where you could include the infinitesimals. You can have a mathematically rigorous and consistent uh, system. You can solve problems using this system. Uh, it, the guy was a guy called uh, Abraham Robinson. Uh, it was in the 1960s. He could only do this in the 20th century because it required uh, mathematics that had been done in the 20th century. They took the real numbers and then they added in infinitesimals into what was already there. So infinitesimals don't exist in the real numbers, but they, they added them in. So they said an infinitesimal is something that satisfies this, right? It is something that is less than all the other real numbers and bigger than zero. Right, so they added these, this idea in. So it is an addition. It's called the hyperreals. So you've got these infinitesimals. Let's call them E. So this is an infinitesimal. And you also have uh, infinites in this, in this system. So you have something that's one over an infinitesimal is an infinite. And that's allowed, that's included. Uh, if you have two numbers that are infinitely close together, if you said x and y are close together, that means x minus y is an infinitesimal. So you, there is an idea of being infinitesimally close in this system. In the real numbers, zero is the only infinitesimal. Um, in the real numbers, we know we, we, we would never do this, would we? One divided by c, zero is not infinity. We would never do that. And that is still true in the hyperreals. Everything that's true in the reals is still true in the hyperreals. So that is not true in the real numbers. And it's not true in the hyperreals either. So something like this, um, x plus y equals y plus x. That's true in the real numbers, and it's true in the hyperreals. Uh, if you have uh, x squared is greater than x, x has to be bigger than 1, that's true in the real numbers, and it's true in the hyperreal numbers. We know that uh, 2x is not equal to x. That's true in the real numbers, and it's true in the hyperreal numbers, which means if you had an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal is not the same as 2 times the infinitesimal. It's not the same as 3 times or 4 times or n times. These are all different. They're all infinitesimals, but they're all different. So these, yeah, these things are not the same. So there's lots of infinitesimals. There's not just one infinitesimal, there are lots. Do you know, there's a nice little quote. It's this guy, a Abraham Robinson, wanted to get into the mind of Leibniz. That was, that's the quote that I've read, that he wants to get into his thinking. And the thinking of infinitesimals and can we make this work and can we use it? Now, this system finally is consistent. It is rigorous. It can be used properly. Uh, it can be used to solve problems. It's called non-standard analysis. Uh, people, fans of this system uh, say it's more intuitive and they say it can solve problems uh, with shorter proofs. It has finally made a, a, another comeback. Because what about now, before we divided by 2, if k was even, 
But in the real numbers, all the non-zero elements, and k is certainly non-zero, all the non-zero elements, you can take their reciprocals. You can divide by them. 